Okay, great. So uh, as Cassie indicated, I'm gonna talk about uh, managed aquifer recharge in California and start off by uh, giving you a little overview of some of California's uh, new uh, laws that have gone into effect. And um, so California passed the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in 2014 and uh, basically, we had a perfect storm, a hydrologic storm, I would say, of, uh, of conditions that led to this. Five years of drought uh, and resulting uh, in less surface water being delivered by the projects, state and federal projects, and due to environmental constraints that have uh, evolved over the years. Um, more groundwater being pumped due to the above, increasing land subsidence in, uh, impacts on water conveyance. And then uh, prior to that, uh, we also saw uh, an increase in the visibility of nitrate uh, contaminated groundwater, especially in the Central Valley and San Joaquin Valley on uh, disadvantaged communities that led to this act being passed. And basically it requires three things. One, you have to create a new uh, groundwater sustainability agency if you're within a Sigma basin. And then you have to create a new groundwater sustainability plan by either January 2020, if you're critically overdrafted, or January 2022 for the other basins, and then become sustainable within 20 years. The state may intervene if the mandates are not met by the locals. So this, uh, this shows what the high and medium priority basins are. There was a set of criteria that the state used to define high and medium priority basins. There's not really a difference in those. Um, it, it's a detailed explanation I won't get into. If you are either high or medium, you're a sigma basin and you have to meet those mandates I mentioned. And then on on the right, you see a slide called critically overdrafted basins. Really, uh, there's two things that uh, that makes a difference between the critically overdrafted and the high and medium priority basins. One, you have two less years to get your plan done. The other is it looks like there's going to be and has been so far more funding available for critically overdrafted basins. So. As I said, here are the requirements again on the left, and this is the current status. So, uh, so far, the uh, number of base uh, GSAs that have formed uh, quite a bit more than the number of Sigma basins, which is 127 Sigma basins. And what's interesting about it is uh, really the law was designed to try to get people to form um, one agency ideally and one sustainability plan covering each one of these sigma basins but as we have found out some of them have up to 22 gsas in a basin which uh, which is going to make it a little bit more difficult to get their plans done and and possibly cost more with coordination agreement and that kind of thing anyway um the sustainability to get to sustainability you really need to either increase supply uh, increase recharge or reduce demand. Some of the statewide challenges we have in California that we're realizing is we need lots of more recharge projects to stabilize groundwater level declines, especially in the San Joaquin Valley, and you need incentives to do so. Need to, to better understand the really the hydrogeology of the state. We've got a lot of good projects in the state and a lot of good management, there are areas where we need to do a lot more and really Sigma raises the bar on groundwater management and it and it requires and it's uh, the governor when he signed this you know it became very clear put it on the locals the locals want to do it it's not the state but the state can intervene if they need to need to know how frequently surface water will be available for recharge, changes in reservoir operation, reoperation, uh, determine potential benefits and adverse impacts of increasing recharge. And then we've got to better uh, understand and um, deal with the regulatory permitting and legal water rights uncertainties. And Graham's gonna cover a lot of this in his talk. Um, 
and so I think it'll be very interesting. Uh, increasing groundwater recharge through changing mac management practices is a recognized pretty major part of the solution, but again, it's it's going to take everything to, to get our basins into sustainability. So what is uh, managing groundwater recharge? Really, it's uh, a key component is managed aquifer recharge, and it's the purposeful recharge of an aquifer under controlled conditions to store the water for later extraction or to achieve environmental benefits. Here are the really the five things you need for um, MAR, as we call it, source of water, conveyance, suitable receiving aquifer. I'll talk about that a little bit more as will Graham. Water rights, you need to deal with that and satisfy the regulations. And so why MAR? It's really a tool to replenish aquifers and supply security. Uh, it's cheaper than many other the other new forms of water supply available. And uh, here are some of the things that can be used for replenish depleted aquifers, enhance groundwater dependent ecosystem and address environmental issues, avoid saline intrusion and mitigate land subsidence, can help offset the cost of flood control and uh, recycled water in urban areas as well. What are the advantages and challenges? Uh, so advantages, smaller impact on land use than, for instance, uh, reservoirs. You don't have some of the other issues uh, with uh, reservoirs, evaporative losses and algal booms, uh, high natural attenuation, it dampens the quality and temperature, lower cost, and can be scaled up over time. So you can start small and build it up so you, you don't have to pay it all at one time. Some of the challenges are you need a suitable aquifer and uh, they're not watertight. You have losses in aquifers uh, and uh, many straws in it sometimes, so it's hard to sort that one out. Surrounding saline water may mix. You can have reactions with source water um, with the groundwater and aquifer matrix, and infiltration recovery rates can be limited by plugging and uh, potentially higher operations and maintenance. Um, it's a proven and well-demonstrated technology. It has been over time, the economics, they can be mutually beneficial projects as well um, and adaptable to different settings, opportunities, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, you can do it in fresh water, brackish or saline water, use drinking water, recycled water, storm water, or additionally groundwater as a source. Uh, some places are doing that, pumping it out of one aquifer and putting it into another. Some of the most common types of MAR, and they're designed governed by the hydrologic setting and hydrology. I know uh, Graham will be talking a lot about uh, surface infiltration and then Van's going to talk about injection, uh, more, more focused on injection. So you can have infiltration and spreading basins, aquifer storage and recovery wells, where you have one well to put the water in and take it out. Another one is an ASTR, which includes treatment. So if you have a long travel distance, you can get some treatment out of the aquifer. There are dry wells, bank, uh, riverbank filtration type of setups, sand or check dams, distributed products, including uh, flood mar, which uh, Graham will touch on, and then low impact development, where you're using a variety of distributed options to uh, put water into the ground in, in uh, urban settings. Some of the design considerations and uh, detailed hydrologic, hydrogeologic uh, characterizations key. And um, there just isn't enough time to go into the details on that. And I think Graham will cover quite a bit of that. Source and receiving water characterization. Here are some of the things you want to test for because you're going to put different water into the subsurface and it's going to react, whether that's a, po a benefit or can be negative. And one of the biggest challenges is clogging it. It just happens, <laughs> whether it's physical, chemical, mechanical, or biological. You can manage that through design, but you have to know what you're designing for by doing the detailed studies up front, and then you can also treat. I'm going to now just run quickly through some examples 
of some of the larger projects we have in the state. And you'll see uh, that Santa Clara Valley Water District up in the left corner where it's situated, it's on the in South San Francisco Bay. And you see the uh, district recharge ponds and facilities in blue. And this uh, was really formed, this district was really formed uh, in, and it took different forms before it actually became the water district, but it formed to deal with land subsidence and flooding in the San Jose area due to over extraction or groundwater mining. Uh, they have three over 300 acres, nearly 400 acres of recharge ponds, 91 miles of controlled in-stream recharge. And they recharge approximately 100,000 acre feet a year. And uh, here's an example of one of the very beautiful uh, recharge ponds, which is multi-benefit. Moving to the west, uh, east, I'm sorry, uh, Sacramento area. The capital, you can see where it says Sacramento in the uh, lower part of the slide, that's about where the capital is. Uh, and so this is the uh, Regional Water Authority, Sacramento Groundwater Authority. I wanted to give this as an example. So this is actually 17 districts. You can see the amount of groundwater extraction uh, they did in 2015. It's surrounded by the American River and the Sacramento River. They had a lot of, they have a lot of surface water, in other words. And what they did uh, to address uh, management here is they cross-connected all these districts, and uh, they ha then uh, have a very extensive conjunctive use program where they can uh, exchange uh, surface water for groundwater. And uh, as a result, they have uh, actually successfully stored nearly 150,000 acre feet of water over the last 10 years. They put a water accounting framework in place and they've set the in-stream flows to avoid fisheries impacts. You can also see in the graph up on the left that they've also done a pretty good job of reducing the amount of the water they're using and the blue is the groundwater and uh, red is total surface water and the image there is some of the science they're doing that's uh, uh, logging an existing supply well to uh, better understand the geology. The next example is Kern Water Bank, and it's in the southern part of the San Joaquin Valley, and this is a true groundwater banking project where they uh, actually started operating in 94, and they have multi-benefit projects for ecosystems, 70 shallow recharge ponds, 7,000 acres. You can see the average recharge rate, um, and uh, they have 84 recovery wells and an annual recovery capacity, about 240,000 acre feet. Um, and uh, you can see just some of the uh, benefits of that. Um, Moving further south, this is the greater LA area. And here you see they have uh, three um, barrier projects, seawater intrusion barriers and spreading basins up at the top. And uh, this was again, seawater intrusion was the catalyst. There were some adjudications. The water replenishment district was formed in 59. And they have, uh, they do about 70,000 acre feet by spreading and 30,000 acre feet by injection. Those are the spreading, some of the spreading basins they use in one of the, uh, one of the treatment plants they have. And then finally, Orange County Water District. Water Replenishment District and Orange County Water District are some of the most advanced with the treatments facilities they have. And here they have over a thousand acres of spreading facilities. And they were established in 1933, first purchase of imported water. Uh, they established a replenishment assessment and then they built the most advanced groundwater replenishment system in the world with an operational uh, current capacity of about 112,000 acre feet a year. And that goes 30 million gallons per day goes to the seawater intrusion barrier, 70 to recharge and uh, they recharge approximately 250,000 acre feet a year. Here shows, uh, again, reminding me the science that you need to do these projects, the complexity of the subsurface. 
uh, in the top image, some of the multi-benefit projects they have with uh, birds, as you can see, and then there's a rubber dam on the left. And finally, uh, this image on the left shows the advanced treatment they go through from uh, tertiary treatment to microfiltration, reverse osmosis, ultraviolet, UV oxidation, I should say, with hydrogen peroxide and how it goes. And I think that's pretty much it for me. Here's a list of references and contacts. I um, want to point out there's a couple of different managed aquifer recharge um, activities, ISMAR 10 in Spain, 2019, and BISMAR 17 in Arizona in 2020. And at that, I'll turn it back over to you, Cassie.